Pastor Hall and I talked about when he when they had to go when they they got the news about her mother and they needed to go he he called me or or he texted me and, and we kind of text back and forth for a little bit but he asked me if I would continue on in the series that he started he felt like that was pretty important but one of the things I recognized immediately was that I can't do it like him that's not to say he's just not not doing it right I love to listen to that man preach he is one good preacher anointed by God and the Holy Spirit he is an excellent excellent expositor of the word and with such passion it's like wow I really do I, I respect him and so I recognize I can't do it like him it's a real stretch for me when I said yes I'll do that because I felt like the Lord was telling me I want to stretch you too and let me tell you something you never get too old to get stretched what you need to do is be willing to be stretched by the Lord. And so this morning, we're going to try and continue on in that series. And he gave me a couple of options, and, and both of them are good. I'm going to go with one of those options here this morning. And next week, Lord willing, I'll go with the other option for next week. And I say Lord willing because I, I'm not sure when their, their plan is to return. I'm not sure what their plan is when they return. But he's our pastor, and I'm anxious to hear him preach again. And if he comes back home before next week and wants to preach, hey, man, I'm all for it. I'm, I'm good. I'm ready to listen. I am ready. I, I am only here to serve. I'm only here to help. That's all I'm here for. But how many of you remember the message from last week? Can I see your hand? I do. It was a gr great message about victory. It was about the victory at Mount Carmel when the fire fell. And man, what an anointed, anointed message. And what a miracle that God performed in sending the fire to consume the sacrifice that Elijah had prepared to prove and demonstrate not only to him, but to all of those that were there, all of the false prophets, those of Israel that had gathered together, the king himself, to prove to them there was but one God, and that was the God in heaven who sits on the throne of authority. Never forget that. Well, I thought about that miracle, and one of the options that, that we talked about was what happened after that miracle. Because Elijah goes and he begins to pray for rain and ask God for rain. He tells, he tells the king, he says, King, get up, eat, get going, because rain's coming. Now, keep in mind, well, anyway, I'm going to get ahead of myself, so I better, I better hold on here just a little bit and back up, because we're going to go back to the beginning where God began to speak to Elijah about what he wanted to do through Elijah. You see, I believe that while miracles are absolutely wonderful, and every one of us here pray that God would work a miracle, sometimes in our lives personally, sometimes in a family member, there's always something that happens and takes place before a miracle ever takes place. And so this week, we're going to look at before the fire fell. Next week, we're going to look at after the fire fell, the Lord willing. Two entirely different sides of Elijah that we're going to see in these two messages, Lord willing. Two entirely different sides. This week, I want you, if you, well, if you have your Bibles, you can turn with me. If you don't have your Bibles, well, okay. Uh, maybe you've got an electronic device you'd like to join us with. That's okay. But uh, in, in uh, 1 Kings chapter 17, verse 1. It says, And Elijah the Tishbite the, of the inhabitants of Gilead said to Ahab, said to the king, As the Lord God of Israel lives, before whom I stand, there shall not be dew nor rain these years except at my word. He said, as the Lord God of Israel lives before whom I stand, there shall not be dew nor rain these years except at my word. That length of time would turn out to be about three and a half years, according to James over in the New Testament. 
So it was going to be a while before any rain would fall. But one of the things I want you to understand about Elijah, before the fire ever fell, before the miracle was ever done, and I believe there was another one that followed that, and we'll talk about that here in just a little bit. But before that ever happened, Elijah had to first be tuned in to God. He had to be in a position where he could hear the voice of God speak. And I believe that oftentimes what happens in our Christian lives is that we get so distracted by life. We get so occupied. And I found myself getting a little occupied this last week. It was a kind of a confusing week for me. I didn't fully understand. And it's kind of like, oh, my goodness, my goodness, my goodness. And yet, the one thing I know, that God has not surrendered authority. So it, it's important that we be tuned in. It's important that we not get distracted by the things that are going on in our lives. One of the greatest, or one of the greatest distractors, one of the ones who tries to do his best to lead us away from the Word of God, to lead us away from the things of God, to get us in a position where we are in fear and in doubt, and that's the enemy of our souls. It was a number of years ago, and I shared this with some of the, the, the couple of guys that was, we were standing out there in, in the foyer, and I shared this with them a few years back, and actually it's been now quite a few years back now as I think about it. It's, it's been a while. We took a trip to Brazil to preach some crusades there, and, and we had some pretty good success in, in preaching those crusades. But while we were there, we traveled by bus from the very northern portion of Brazil all the way down to the southern exit out of Brazil, Foz Iguaçu. And during that trip, we touched many cities, we preached a number of crusades, and, and we had some great results. But during that, during that trip, we stayed with some folks in their homes, and that's, that's kind of the way we preferred. You know, there were times where they would put us up in a hotel, and I would much rather have been staying with one of, the, one of the people of the church or something along that line. I know that that was a big thing for them, but it was also a big thing for me. One of the things that I'd like to do, have liked to do, liked to do through the years, one of the things I'd like to do, still like to do it, is I like to go for walks. Well, we traveled through some pretty sketchy places in Brazil. One of the... One of the parts of about any of the big cities, it was called the Flavela, Flavela, and that was, that is a, uh, basically we would call it in English, we'd call it a slum, where the poor people lived, and there were indeed some poor people, but it was also where the bad people lived, people who did drugs and sold drugs, people who did other kinds of crime, not a real safe place to go walking. Max, who is our ad adopted son, I say adopted, not formally adopted, but he calls us mom, he calls us dad. We met him quite a number of years ago. He was our interpreter there. He's the one that kind of went before us and kind of set things up for us so that we could come down and, and preach there, but he worked as my interpreter. And so I would go out in some of these sketchier places, and I would do as what, I, what I like to do, what I've done all along. I would go for a walk. I remember distinctly, it was just before we were getting ready to leave Brazil, and we were in one of those places where maybe it wasn't the safest thing to, to do, but yet I wanted to walk, so I got out and walked. I came back, and Max meets me at the door. Dad! You can't walk out there, here. It's dangerous. And I looked him in the eye, and I told him this. I said, Max, I've made up my mind. I am absolutely not going to live in fear. The worst that could happen to me is they kill me. Exactly. I get to go to heaven. I get to go be with my Lord. Now, don't misunderstand me. I'm not walking out in front of a, tr a, cut, a truck or a car or any other vehicle of any kind in order to end it to get there sooner because that's not God's plan. That's not God's purpose for me, or for you, for that matter. But I refuse to live in fear. One of the things that I look at Elijah and I think, oh, man, this, is, this has got to be one of those things that really helped him to tune in to hear the voice of God, was that he refused to walk in fear. 
fear of God, yes, in the sense that he respected God and recognized that God is God, and God is all-powerful, and God is awesome, all-knowing, all of those kinds of things, but he refused to live in fear, to walk in front of not only God, but in front of the king, because he addresses a man who could have taken his life, a man that refused to walk in fear. You see, it's kind of a fearful thing to stand and witness to others. Anybody here ever tried to do that? I remember the first time I tried to do it, it was kind of like, oh my goodness, what am I going to say? What am I going to do? It was kind of scary. But it's when we lose our fear or sense of fear and refuse to walk in fear that God can then begin to speak to us and God can then begin to give us direction. It's a scary thing for me personally after, well, a number of years. We won't go into the length of time because it kind of bothers me. i got a birthday coming up next month, or not next month, but this year that's going to, oh, my, push me beyond a mark that I, like, oh, goodness gracious, it's hard to believe I'm going to be there yet. But (laughs) scary thing. Even now, for me to stand before a crowd, big ones, and I've preached to some big crowds, and little ones, doesn't make any difference. I preach the same whether it's five or it's 50, 60,000, doesn't make any difference. I preach the same. But it's a fearful thing. It's kind of scary. You see, we need to understand that we have to recognize that it is the God we serve. Why was he not afraid? Because he says, as the Lord God of Israel lives, he recognized that his God was not dead, but his God was alive. His God was all-powerful. His God was all-knowing. And he stood in the confidence that his God had his back. And I believe that as children of God, as we go forward in whatever this year may bring or next few years may bring, if we go forward recognizing that our God has our back, we have nothing to fear, and it'll make it a lot easier to hear from God when you're not preoccupied with fear and concern. So he was a man who didn't refuse to walk in fear. He was tuned in to God. He says in, in Israel, he says, as the Lord God of Israel lives, my God lives. He says, before whom I stand. Let's think about that phrase for just a moment. Why would Elijah stand before God? I think it's in the Message Bible. I, I could have it wrong because I've looked at a couple of different ones, a couple of different translations of that. But it says, the, the God that I, who I stand before or who I serve. In other words, he was standing there because he was a servant of God. Think of this for a moment. An earthly king on a throne, and he's got all kinds of people around him that are, that are there for one purpose, to hear the command of the king and then to go do it. Whether it's to take a message to someone or to go make a proclamation of some kind, that man or that woman stands there but for one reason, to serve the king to do his bidding, and that was Elijah. Elijah had made up his mind that he was going to do the bidding of the Lord, whatever that may mean. If it meant facing off with the king, then so be it. He would face off with the king. If it meant facing off with 450 prophets of Baal, then that was all right. He would face off with the 450 prophets of Baal. If it meant that he had to walk through the valley of the shadow of death, that was okay because he belonged to God. You see, he recognized that he was there standing in service to God to do whatever God said. You see, sometimes we don't hear from God because we're not willing to do what God might say. There are times in our lives where God will may try to ask us to do something, but we're saying, oh, no, not me. I can't do that. Let me give you an example, practical. How many of you have ever been taught to teach a Sunday school class? Now, you don't have to show your hands because I'm not trying to embarrass anybody, but how many people have ever been responded with this statement or something similar to it? I can't do that. I don't know how to do that. I've never done that before. That puts a little bit of fear in us. Well, you see, in order to hear from God, you've got to be willing to say, hey, you know what, God? I'm not going to allow this fear to stop me 
from serving you because when I stand before you, I stand before you as a servant. I stand before you not as one with his hands out trying to get all the goodies that I can get, but I'm standing before you as one who is ready to serve you and if need be, die for you. You see, I believe that the thing that caused Isaiah, to, or excuse me, Elijah, to be so, so fearless in the face of those prophets was that he recognized who his God was and what his position before his God was. His position was a servant. He was tuned in to hear. And then God speaks to him in verse 2 again. He says, And then the word of the Lord came to him, saying, Oh, yeah, excuse me, wait a minute. I, I, I knew I was going to get, I told you I was a little bit on the nervous side. I warned you. But he said, the, the God before whom I stand, whom I stand to serve, there shall not be. He makes this proclamation, which is kind of a bold one to say to a king. It's not going to rain. There's not going to be any dew it's for these next whatever number of years, because he doesn't give a number of years for these next years, except at my word. Except at my word. Where did Elijah's word come from? It came from God. How do I know that? Because he stood before him as a servant. And God said, here's what I'm going to do. Here's what I want you to tell the king. Here's what I want you to do. You see, oftentimes, what, we, what we're supposed to be doing is sharing what God has said. What has God told us to do when it comes to the lost? Preach the word. What, is God, what, what were some of the last words of Jesus before he ascended into heaven. Go into all the world and make disciples. In order to make a disciple, you got to first get a convert. And in order to get a convert, you got to preach the Word of God. And so he is speaking what God has spoken to him. God has said, hey, I want you to tell Ahab that there's not going to be any rain, there's not going to be any dew, except at my word. And then God goes on to say something that I thought was kind of puzzling on one hand. He says, Then the word of the Lord came to him, saying, Get away from here. In other words, leave. I'm going to put it in different words, and you'll see why in a moment. Run. Run. And he says, he says Get away from here and turn eastward and, and hide by the brook Cherith, which flows into the Jordan. What's he telling Elijah to do who stands before this living God? He says, Elijah, I want you to run, and I want you to go hide. I want you to go hide for a while. Pastor Hall shared something with me that I thought, good, I, great, because I, 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 I want to give credit to where credit's due. He said, you know, there's a time to hide, and there's a time to go public. There's a time to speak what God has given. There's a time to hold in what God has given. And that's where we need the wisdom of the Holy Spirit. That's where we need the direction of the Lord in order to know when to speak and when to hold our peace. But he tells him, he says, Elijah, I want you to go and I want you to hide by the brook Cherith. And what's he tell him that he's going to do? He says, I'm going to send the ravens and they're going to feed you. And you're going to drink from the, from the brook that flows by. And so he does. He's obedient to God. He is a servant of God. He's obedient. He runs and he hides. From probably from Ahab because he delivered a disturbing piece of news to Ahab. But he runs and he hides. And I would more like to think of him rather than hiding and cowering in fear, I see him hiding away with God. Hiding. And God said, I'm going to provide some food for you. I'm going to send the raven. How would you like ravens to bring your food? I'm thinking I'd really want to pray over that stuff hard. Because I've seen what raven, ravens eat, and it's not real appetizing, but the ravens did just exactly as God said they would, because God said they would do that. He told him, he said, I'm going to take care of you. You see, that's the good news, is when God says, hey, I want you to hide out for a little bit, I want you to be silent for a little bit, know that God is behind the scenes working all things together for your good and for my good and for his glory. You see, he told you to go and hide. The ravens are going to feed you, and they did that. The Bible says they came in the morning with breakfast and in the evening with dinner. Skip lunch. 
man, that's, that's a good meal, but they skip lunch. The thought that came to me, the, the question that came to my mind is, what did Elijah do during the day? He eats breakfast in the morning. He eats dinner at night, and the time in between is his. What's he doing during that time? I can only speculate. That's all we can ever do. But I kind of suspect just because of what I understand about Elijah, I believe he was still continuing to commune with God while he was hiding away, while the God was providing in a miraculous way. He was continuing to spend his time talking to God hearing from God, being strengthened by God so that he could continue to do what God had told him to do. And so he, I believe he, that's what he's doing. There's a time to hide. There's a time to get out and be public, to get alone with God. And one of the things that I noticed about the life of Elijah that I hadn't seen before is how much time that guy spent alone with God. He was not in the public eye very often. He was not in the public eye for very long periods of time. Much of his time was spent alone, either in a wilderness or by a brook or someplace else, and eventually next week it's in a cave or it's actually on a trip that he's taking. We'll get to that next week. But he spent a lot of time alone where God could talk to him and where God could, could give him the direction that he needed. He needed to hear from God, you see, what was coming up next because what happens in the next of the story, and you can go ahead and read on down there if you like, but and then for the sake of time, I'm not going to try to read all the Scripture, but the next thing that happens is that the brook dries up. How many of you know it doesn't take, I mean, a brook doesn't dry up just overnight unless it gets dammed somewhere along the line? takes a little while for that brook to dry up. So he was there for a considerable amount, of considerable amount of time. And the brook dries up. Now, you can imagine, Elijah, the, bro the brook dries up. Okay, now what, Lord? Now what do I need to do? You see, God was sending him a message. There's, there's something else that I've got for you to do. There's some other way that I want to provide for you. And he sends him to a widow. And we won't go into that story. That's a completely different story. But he begins to provide for him because God speaks to Elijah. Understand now what is happening with Elijah. From the time that he was standing before God to the time that he went out and hid to the time that he now follows the word of the Lord and goes to a widow who's going to provide for him that God has already spoken to and made a way for it. He's learning to tune in and to hear the voice of God. I believe that there is a time where we need to learn the voice of God. Let me tell you why we need to learn the voice of God or why, why I believe we need to learn the voice of God. How many of you remember Samuel? What was Samuel in the Bible? A prophet. A prophet of God. Starts out as a young man in, in, the, in the school of, of Eli, if you will, under Eli's care. Nighttime comes, he's laying down on his bed, and he begins to hear a voice. Samuel, Samuel, Samuel. He doesn't recognize it. He goes into Eli and says, hey, it, it, I've, I've heard this voice, and, and, and it's, it's calling my name. It's, it, it, you called me. Well, I haven't called you. Go lay down. Happens again. He goes in, and he says, oh, my goodness. Hey, did you call me? I know I heard this voice. And Eli eventually tells him, he says, hey, here's what I want you to do the next time you hear it. Say, yes, Lord, what is it? That's a rough paraphrase of mine because I haven't memorized the scripture. Yes, Lord, what is it? And it was from that point on that he began to get more and more familiar with the voice of the Lord. Because I can tell you sometimes it's hard to know exactly what God wants. Sometimes it takes a, a lot of prayer. Sometimes it takes a lot of getting into God's Word. Sometimes it takes a little bit of counsel or a lot of counseling, talking with someone that, that is a, a, a good uh, spiritual mentor, if you will, but talking to someone, help you understand what's going on, help you understand what's being done, done, what you're experiencing. Samuel had to learn the voice of God. We, too, have to learn to hear the voice of God. And then in Kings 18, verse 1, 
And it came to pass after many days. Now, this is prior to the Mount Carmel miracle, the falling of the fire. And it says, It came to pass after many days that the word of the Lord came to Elijah. In the third year, and I want you to note that, in the third year, saying, Go, present yourself to Ahab, and I will, will send rain on the earth. In the third year. We've already established how long the drought went for. How long was it? Do you remember? Three and a half years. Go read, uh, I think it's the fifth chapter. It's in the fifth chapter of James. Three and a half years, which means there are six more months of drought. And I say that because it's important to recognize God doesn't always move quickly. And sometimes I've experienced it in my own life. Sometimes it seems like God has morphed into a snail. Because he's not moving very fast, in my estimation. And it's kind of like, I want him to do it, and I want him to do it now. If you tell me you're going to do something, then do what you said. But all the while, God was working in Elijah. And I believe that there are times where God says, hey, here's what I'm going to do. Here's what I want to do through you. And it doesn't happen right away. What are you trying to do? Form you, mold you, shape you, stretch you, do something in you for your good and for his glory. You see, I believe that there are, there are times, as we said earlier, times to hide and times to proclaim. There are times where we need to, to hear from God, and there are sometimes delays in the things that God says. But God clearly says to him, Go, present yourself to Ahab, and I will send rain on the earth. And so the rest of chapter 18 deals, or much of the rest of chapter 18 deals with him getting to Mount Carmel, him calling and challenging the, the, uh, the prophets of Baal. And so there were some other false prophets along with them in, in that particular group of people. But Pastor Hall did a great job of that. I'm not going to try to re-preach his message. He did a good job. But it's prior to that that this occurs and the rest of the chapter is about that great event, the falling of the fire. But then Elijah makes a statement because God speaks to Elijah, verse 18. That's, that's the second point, by the way. I haven't given you points, but that's the second point in my message, or the message I believe God gave me, is that God spoke to Elijah. We've already seen examples of that, but here he gives him a very specific word, which I think is absolutely fantastic. Whoops. Uh, or, yeah, he spoke to Elijah, what we just said. And then Elijah, excuse me, i got to get down to my third point. Then Elijah speaks for God. God spoke to Elijah and said that, hey, go tell Ahab, I'm going to send rain. That rain's not going to come for six months. Now, God didn't tell him that. God didn't inform him of his time period. And guess what? God operates differently than you and I do in terms of time. But God tells him, go tell Ahab that it's going to rain. And so verse 41, if you want to turn there in, of chapter 18, says, then Elijah said to Ahab, go up, or, or let, me, let me just put it a little bit clearer, I think. It's a little bit clearer. It's in some of the other, some of the other translations. Get up and eat and drink, for there is the sound of abundance of rain. And Ahab went up, or got up, to eat and drink. And Elijah went up on, to the top of Carmel, and then he bowed down. Oh, excuse me, I'm going to get ahead of myself again. We'll stop there for just a moment. He said to Elijah, hey, I hear the sound of an abundance of rain. Now keep in mind, this is six months prior to the rain falling. The six-month clock may have started in the first verse. I don't know about that. But it's going to be right around that period of time. It's not going to be tomorrow that the rain comes. And so he's, he's been told, he says, hey, I hear the sound of an abundance of rain. He's already been waiting for an, a period of time for the rain. But God has said, hey, I'm going to send rain. And he said, I want you to go and tell Ahab. And so he goes and he tells Ahab, hey, I hear the sound of an abundance of rain. 
This is another idea from Pastor Joe. I love the way the man thinks. Let's see if I can get it the way he, he shared it. I may not get it exactly, so please forgive me, Pastor. But I, I, I thought it was great. He said, that reminds me of when God said, I will pour out my spirit. Ain't that cool? I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. Ain't that neat? God, you know, God tells Elijah, hey, before you go up and you tell Ahab that, hey, here's what's going to happen, and, and I want you to go up, and I want you to eat and drink, he does that, and then what does Elijah do, which I think is fascinating? He immediately goes up on Carmel. Where did the miracle, where did the fire fall? Was on Mount Carmel. He returns to the place of the fire, and he begins to pray. And ask God, I believe, to do what God has said he was going to do. And I got to thinking about that. Why would he need to pray? Think about it. God's told him it's going to rain. He's announced it to Ahab. It's going to rain. But what's he do? He bows his knees and tucks his head between his knees. In a position of humility, in a position of submission, and in a position of prayer. Once again, praying and asking God. You know why sometimes God doesn't move as quickly as what we might like, or sometimes he doesn't seem to move at all? Because we get so distracted by so many other things that we don't spend the time in prayer that we need to spend. And I know I stepped on somebody's toes. I know I did. We don't spend enough time in the Word of God. It absolutely blows me away after, after pastoring for so many years, the number of Christians that I've met along the way, along the path. Nobody here, I hope, but I don't know. That's why I'll share it. But how many Christians don't take time to read the Word of God on a daily basis? How can you ever hear from God if you don't read His Word? The number of Christians that go day by day by day and never spend intimate time in prayer with God. How can you ever expect to hear from God or for God to move and listen and do what he said if you don't take time to pray? It was important for Elijah to pray. Why? As an example to us. It's important for us to pray. And let me tell you what. There has never been a time in my lifetime and I'm soon to be 70. Never been a time in my lifetime where this world needs prayer more than the present time in which we live. Not prayer that our will be done. Not prayer in telling God, here's how you got to do it. But praying, God, your will be done on earth, even as it is in heaven. Let it be done if it means discomfort for me, if it means hardship for me, that's okay, Lord, but your will be done, even on earth as it is in heaven. That's a bold prayer to have to pray, but that's the way we were taught to pray by Jesus. Elijah is bowing down. He sends his servant. He says, go look. Go out and look into the sea. And you just keep in mind, they're up on Mount Carmel. He says to him, literally, I think it's in the version I've got, it says go up, but it's basically they're already on top. There may have been some other hills or better vantage point for him to go to. But he goes up and he looks and he sees nothing. Comes back to Elijah. And Elijah asks him, what do you see? While he's gone, of course, Elijah's praying. What do you see? Nothing. He goes up a second time. He looks and he comes back to Elijah. Elijah, Elijah asks him, what did you see? Nothing. The third time, he goes up to see at Elijah's command. Comes back, what did you see? Nothing. I think here's about where I begin to say, hmm, did I hear from God in the first place? Oh, I know you've never asked that question. Because sometimes God delays Sometimes God's not in that big a rush. Because, see, there's still some work in Elijah that needed to be done. He was a prophet of God, and yet there were things that needed to be done in his life. So he sends him up a fourth time. 
comes back. What did you see? Nothing. Nothing. Now, what has Elijah told the king? I hear. Is that word here present tense or past tense, all of you English majors? Present tense. Exactly. I hear the sound of an abundance of rain. What was he declaring? He was declaring by faith that God was going to fulfill his word. I hear the sound of an abundance of rain. Why? Because God said, God said, I'm going to send rain. 18.1 is when he said it. I'm going to send. That, that's chapter 18, verse 1, not the year. But <laughs> weird thoughts come into my head sometimes. I'm going to send rain, and Elijah, by faith, declares it. There's another thing that needs to be done by Christians as well. Not only being in the Word, not only praying, but declaring what God has said. Not, decla not declaring what our desire is, but declaring what God has said. I know some, some, some of, you know, we, my wife and I naturally have talked about, I wonder what's going to happen in this coming year, and so on and so forth, and and she's li listening to some things, and, and I'm hearing the things that she's listening to, and I'm praying that they're right. But God hasn't told me what it is that he's going to do. But what I do know is that there is a God behind the scenes who has not surrendered authority. And that God's will will be done. How do I know that? Because the Word of God says so. How do I know that? Because I read it. You know what it says? There is no authority, there is no government, except God establishes it and puts it up. What about the bad guys? Ahab was a bad guy. Who put him into that position? God did. Now I'm praying. I'm praying, God, don't let that be. I'm believing for God to do something different because he hasn't told me different. But he kept, I, I, Elijah, he's on the fourth time, and he sends this guy up again the fifth time. And he comes back to him and he says, what did you see the fifth time? Nothing. Two more, or one more time that happens where he comes back with the message. Nothing has happened. Six times. Six times. But on the seventh time, the seventh time, God's perfect number, the seventh time, the number of completion, the seventh time, he comes back, and Elijah looks up from his position of prayer. What did you see? I saw a cloud. Now, if I'd have been Elijah, I'd have been hoping for a great big monstrous storm cloud that's coming through. But what I saw was a cloud the size of a man's hand. Now, how big is that? Well, I'll tell you what you do. Put your hand right there. How big's your hand? The size of a man's hand. How big was that cloud? I don't know, but it wasn't much. And it was one cloud that he came back and reported to Elijah that he saw. Look at, look at if you will, uh, let's see here. Uh, blah, 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 blah. So he's, you see, now, uh, he, let's see, verse 45. Now it happened that in the meantime the skies became, or wait a minute, let me back up. I, I went too far on my scroll. Okay, yeah, verse, verse 43, the last portion of it says, and this happened, this came to pass seven times. It is when it happened. And it came to pass the seventh time that he said, there is a cloud as small as a man's hand rising out of the sea. And so he said, get up, go tell Ahab, prepare your chariot. Now he told Ahab earlier, get up and go eat. Because you're going to have to take a journey. Because he's going to have to run clear back to Jezreel from where he is. And that's a little bit of a trip that he's got to make to get back to where he was going. But he says, get up and eat. And now he's telling him, he says, go and you tell him. How would you like to have been Ahab's or Elijah's servant at that time? Go tell the king. Tell the king? Man, you're a prophet. That's your job. You're supposed to tell the king. 
Pastor Hall, it's your job to win the lost. No, it's not. It's your job and my job. It's his job too, but it's our job is to win the lost. Ahab's servant has to go up, or Elijah's servant, excuse me, Elijah's servant's got to go now and tell the king that king, let me, let me get here and so I read it, said, prepare your chariot and go down before the rain stops you. Now keep in mind, Ahab has experienced for seven and a half years nothing but drought. And now this man, not even the prophet, not even good enough to merit Elijah coming and sharing this news with him, but Elijah's servant coming and sharing this message with him. I think I'd have been scared if I had been his servant, but I think his servant knew some of the same things that Elijah had done. He'd followed him for a while. He'd, big, he'd experienced the miraculous. I believe he saw the fire fall. I believe he saw the, the other miracles that were done and the things that had happened throughout the ministry of Elijah. And so he goes and he tells them. He says, in the meantime, though, he, look at what happens. Now it happened in the meantime that the sky became black with clouds and wind and there was a heavy rain. So Ahab rode away and went to Jezreel. And so the, the rain begins to fall. He saw, first of all, the cloud. And I thought about the cloud for just a moment, and I thought, you know, on the day of Pentecost, the Holy Spirit was poured out, but it was only on 120. Like a small cloud. You see where I'm going? What's God want to do in these last days? Pour out His Spirit. Where? On 120? Uh-uh on my people. He'll pour out His Spirit on all flesh. In other words, that's available for everybody that there is. And if there was ever a time, we need not only the anointing, but the power and the wisdom of the Holy Spirit operating in our lives. It is the day in which we live today. We need Him. He is, by the way, He is the third person of the Trinity. He is God the Spirit. And we need Him. We need Him. We need Him. Just as they needed the rain, not only from the small cloud, but from the abundance of rain that Elijah talked about, they needed that rain. We too need an abundance of the Holy Spirit poured out into our lives. Because what begins to happen in your life and in my life things really begin to change. Change. I never in my wildest dreams ever believed I would ever stand before a crowd of about 70,000 people and preach a 15-minute message on salvation. I was the main speaker that night. 15 minutes. Now keep in mind, I'm working through a translator. It takes him as long to translate it as it does me to deliver it. I preach for seven and a half minutes. A simple truth. Jesus saves, and not just those words, but that's the truth that I presented for those seven minutes, the seven and a half minutes. And there when the time came time for the altar call to be given, it was given, and the people flooded down from the stadium, because we were in a soccer stadium, down from that stadium onto that field, and they began to, to cry out to God. Many of them got saved. And Brazil is not like of America, not like America. They don't quickly proclaim, hey, you had this number of people saved, this number of people, blah, 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 with all the statistics. They wait. They wait. At minimum one year before you ever hear back on what the actual results were and there were people that not only got saved but there were people who were called to preach there were people who were who were anointed by God to do great things in the kingdom of God and all of that uh, 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 I can't do that you told me that I was gonna do that when I went to Brazil I'm not so sure I'd have gone except one thing years ago before I ever got saved God gave me a dream. I wasn't saved. God gave me a dream. And in that dream, 
I was standing before huge crowds. And keep in mind, I'm probably, oh gosh, I am in maybe junior high, maybe the first years of high school. But in that dream, I am standing before literally a mass of people. Didn't try to count them, but a mass of people. And I got no idea what I'm telling them or what I'm doing in front of them. But I am up there giving them a what for. God gave me a dream. God gave me the understanding of that dream after I got saved. He said, you're going to stand before people. And you're going to proclaim my word. And that scared the bejeebers out of me. I had a tough time getting through English class because we had to give oral book reports. I don't do well in front of crowds. On the inside, I may look, or on the outside, I may look like I'm confident, but on the inside, I am scared. I am scared, but I know that my God has said, do this, and God, I have done it, and God has always brought me through. My point is this. Don't be afraid of what God may do in you and through you if you will yield to him and hear his voice. God has great things in store for you as well. God's got great things in store for this church. Pastor Hall, God has called you. God has called you to this place at this time. Sister Tammy, God has called you as his help me to this place at this time. And God has great things in store for you as well in this church. And you can take that as prophetic or you can call me off my rocker, but mark my words as God has spoken. God will do. God will do. Because he is a God behind the scenes, if the music will now come, please, who has not surrendered authority. He is in control. You say chaos? Yep, he's in control. Trust him. Trust him. Trust him. And when you walk out these doors here in a little bit, don't walk out in fear. Don't walk out being intimidated. Don't walk out being discouraged. Because if there was ever a time we need people of faith, it's right now. People who will stand upon the word of God and proclaim it and believe it. In Jesus' name.